Oklahoma is the land of second, third, and last chances. Who were the people that made it so? The Red River Institute, johnjdwyer.com, me, Gwen Falconer Lippert, and our signature sponsor, Atwoods, present Oklahoma Gold. Together with award-winning author and historian, John J. Dwyer, we'll stitch the golden threads of Oklahoma history. Here now on Oklahoma Gold. Dignifying our history through the stories we find and share. Cherokee Romeo and Puritan Juliet in Oklahoma history. John J. Dwyer, what is this story? That's right, Gwen. And today we're going to have the opportunity to meet one of the great and forgotten martyrs of Oklahoma history. It's his epic romance and life with the blonde-headed New England Puritan beauty who herself, believe it or not, profoundly helped craft that history of Oklahoma, though she died before ever setting foot on our land. Elias Boudinot lived for his family, his tribe, and his savior, and ultimately died for them. Meanwhile, though, the legacy of Elias and his first wife, Harriet Ruggles Gold, the great love of his life, illustrates how two people, though beset with struggles and conflict, nonetheless can and did shape the destiny of a society for the better for both the individual and the whole people. Such were the deeds of this Cherokee Romeo and Puritan Juliet. Elias was born in northwestern Georgia in the early 1800s to converted Christian Cherokee parents as Galagina, his Cherokee name. He attended the nearby Spring Place Moravian Mission School as Buck Waity. Fame would one day mark his younger brother Stand as well, And as you know, we also explore Stand and another Oklahoma gold. A brilliant, handsome, and determined young man, Buck Whitey stimulated sufficient confidence in his character and potential that the well-known American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions invited him to apply to their prestigious Cornwall, Connecticut Foreign Mission School. The 25 members of his class hailed from various indigenous tribes, Hawaii, Tahiti, and China, and a few were white Americans. The school aimed to develop its students into doctors, lawyers, missionaries, and interpreters in order to promote Christianity and civilization, particularly among previously non-Christian cultures. Buck's similarly gifted Cherokee cousin John Ridge later joined him at Cornwall. Through Ridge, Buck met the most important person of his life, beautiful white Puritan Harriet Gold, whose father Samuel doctored John Ridge through a serious illness. Both Ridge and Buck, light-skinned natives possessing some white blood, developed friendships with women of esteemed New England Christian families. The marriage to another prominent young Puritan maiden, Sarah Bird Northrop, to which Ridge's friendship led, shook Cornwall society, demonstrating that embedded racism pervaded the past of the whole of America, not merely sections or regions. Buck, meanwhile, assuming the name of Elias Boudinot in honor of the famous American founding father who mentored and helped support him, joined the First Congregational Church of Cornwall. This led to visits at the Gold Home. For two years, Elias and Harriet corresponded after he graduated from Cornwall, taught, then returned to Georgia to minister to his tribe. Then she asked her parents' permission to marry him. They knew of Harriet's long desire to serve God as a missionary, and they knew and respected the staunchly Puritan Elias. The new revelation, however, stupefied them, especially after her devout father, unaware of Harriet's feelings for Elias, assured critics of interracial romances at Cornwall that such was not a phenomenon beyond the Ridge-Northrop relationship. The Gulls refused their permission and sent Elias a hard letter of rejection. Acute despair, meanwhile, soon struck Harriet, followed by an illness so debilitating that her family members described her as hovering between life and death. In a development of great historical portent for the future West, her wise father began to question whether he and his wife might be fighting against God, in his words, in the matter. 
After much prayer and contemplation, he wrote Elias another letter. This time, he said that if the Cherokee retained his desire for Harriet's hand in one year, the Gulls would grant their blessing. Sent weeks later, the second letter providentially reached Elias before the first. The drama, however, was only beginning. After Harriet recovered from her sickness, Elias fulfilled his obligation. Her parents, trusting in God, honored their word, and news of the pending interracial matrimony leaked out. Rage swept through the New England region, including many of the churched. Pastors of churches large and small, including the famed Lyman Beecher and other leaders of the Cornwall Foreign Mission School, declared not only their opposition to the marriage, but their disgust. In addition, they published bans or public notice of the marriage with a view toward citizens voicing opposition they might have, in this case due to the socially unacceptable practice of interracial marriage. The persecution of Harriet and Elias grew more acute as it unfolded members of her own family. Some of them accused her of faking a serious illness to maneuver her father's sympathy and support for marriage. Fellow members of her choir wore black armbands to signify her death, then expelled her from the group. Cornwall townspeople rioted against the marriage, dragging her body through the streets in effigy. And her own beloved brother Stephen spearheaded its burning in the middle of town as she looked on in horror from a nearby hiding spot, and he threatened to kill Elias on sight. My heart truly sang with anguish at the dreadful scene, Harriet wrote. Elias, meanwhile, received written death threats. Harriet had her hometown supporters, but the violence-prone vitriol of her condemners cowed them into silence. Many times in her testament, she had read the words written for those in distress, wrote Elias's biographer Ralph Gabriel, referring to Jesus' words in Matthew 5, 12. Those words read, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you, and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Harriet told her friends Flora and Herman Vale, Pen cannot describe nor language express the numerous and trying scenes through which I have passed, but I've had that support through them all which the world could not give. Never before did I so much realize the work of religion and faith, and so much pity those who in time of trouble were without this inestimable treasure. I have seen the time when I could close my eyes upon every earthly object and look up to God as my only supporter, my only hope, when I could say with emotion I never felt before to my heavenly Father, other refuge have I none, so I helpless hang on thee. Well, the sad reality emerged that here, as in other societies, Christian and not, the gospel beckoned all commerce, but white women were available only to white men. Came the day in 1826, though, that Elias Boudinot rode into Cornwall to claim his bride. His enemies had apparently melted away because none showed to confront him. Elias and Harriet, bound together in love like never before, wed in a nearby town and left for the southern mountains in the Cherokee country. So the Cherokee Romeo got to marry the Puritan Juliet? And took her south with him. What's the golden nugget? This is Oklahoma Gold. Dignifying our history through the stories we share. Our story took place in Oklahoma. John J. Dwyer, tell me about the Cherokee Romeo and the Puritan Juliet who moved to Oklahoma. That's right. Well, only one of them moved to Oklahoma, as we're getting ready to find out. We were talking before the break, Gwen, about Elias Boudinot, who took on the name of a great American founding father who was his benefactor, was a, a, a luminary, a brilliant young Cherokee in the early 1800s and married Harriet Ruggles Gold, a beautiful blonde-headed maiden, one of the finest Puritan families in New England. Well, they lived lives that would reshape in many positive ways the course of Cherokee, Oklahoma, and American history. They had six children. One of those, Elias C. Boudinot, 
uh, the son of Elias Boonot, who was the namesake of Elias Boonot, the American founding father, three Eliases. So his Indian name was? His Indian name was originally Galagina. Then the anglicized version of that was Buck Waity, as in Stan Waity, who was his brother. Many of our listeners know of him. And then he took the name Elias Boonot. Yes, in honor. That was, uh, that was done quite a bit back then. Well, the third of the Elias Boonots would grow up to become the founder of the Oklahoma town of Venita and the greatest voice of all for opening the tens of thousands of sparsely settled Indian Territory miles that birthed the famed land runs and other land openings. Well, back in 1828, though, uh, early in their marriage, Elias co-founded North America's first native newspaper, the Cherokee Advocate. It communicated news and information of interest to Cherokees in alternating columns of English and Cherokee. He poured his heart into the advancement of the Christian faith among the tribe and the destruction of the white engineered liquor trade that was ravaging it. And he eventually grew into the most eloquent voice for the Cherokees moving west to Indian territory in order to survive this liquor cataclysm, as well as the enormous theft of Cherokee lands during a historic gold rush in Georgia and growing mistreatment of the natives that accompanied it. Tribal leadership, though, among the Cherokees bitterly opposed his far-sighted views on these matters. And these are controversial hot buttons among the Cherokees even today here in Oklahoma. Personal affairs continued for Elias through all these momentous events, in particular his enduring romance with Harriet. I look now back to that day with pleasure and with gratitude. She wistfully wrote her sister Flora concerning her marriage to Elias. Yes, I am thankful. I remember the trials I had to encounter, the thorny path I had to tread, the bitter cup I had to drink, but a consciousness of doing right, a kind and affectionate devoted husband, together with many other blessings, have made amends for all. Puritan Harriet's Christian faith and her trust in a truly sovereign God ruling well in the affairs of humankind and herself alike had grown during her years in Georgia with the Cherokees. But no longer possessing her youth and having borne six children in less than nine years and faced with devastating fury turned against her husband and other signers of the Treaty of New Echota that traded Cherokee lands in the southeast for millions of dollars, supplies, and other considerations for the tribe and a beautiful land in modern-day Oklahoma and Kansas, Harriet gave birth to a stillborn seventh child and herself fell victim to a torturous and mortal illness. Elias recalled the overwhelming events that now occurred. She suffered, I'm quoting now, she suffered extreme bodily pain throughout her whole sickness, and it had considerable effect upon her mind. She complained of darkness in the fore part of it, but towards the latter she said her darkness was removed, that there was a clear sky between her and her Redeemer. The morning before she died, after the most distressing night she had had, she called us to her bed. Upon my inquiring how she did, she replied that she was in great distress, meaning bodily distress. I hope, she said, this is the last night I shall spend in this world. Then how sweet will be the conqueror's song. Well, are your doubts removed? Elias asked her. Yes, she said. Are you happy, notwithstanding all your bodily pain and affliction? He asked. I am happy, she said. Elias recorded her final words, which she lovingly spoke to her children. And I quote now, It has been my sole wish and prayer to God that you may become Christians and be useful in the world and finally be happy in the world to come, end quote. What a woman. You know, Gwen, we speak of the founding fathers of America and even of Oklahoma. When you consider the enduring influence of both Elias, her husband, and Elias, her son, on the center state, it may not be a reach to consider Harriet Gold Boudinot a priceless founding grandmother of Oklahoma, a place she never even saw, but which her stainless influence 200 years later, is reaching to us all across those years, and now even centuries. Their star-crossed but magnificent love left a towering testament to all Oklahomans of the power of selfless sacrifice, hearts united in the love and service of Christ, and the ability to overcome all odds, including racial prejudice, cultural chasms, and intergenerational hatred. Their love testifies that with humankind, such intimidating odds may be impossible, but with the Almighty God of the Bible, that they both served and followed to the end of their earthly lives, all things are indeed possible.